You don't have to be the victim of your environment, you can also be the architect of it. When life doesn't challenge you, I think it's important to challenge yourself. The other, the ultimate meta habit is reading because if you build a habit of reading, you can solve pretty much any other problem. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. What's up, Believe Nation? It's Evan, I believe in you, and this channel is designed to be a part of your daily success routine. So let's get your motivation to a 10 and get you believing in you. Grab a snack and chew on today's lessons from a man who went from being a star athlete in high school to failing his first venture as an entrepreneur to now being an expert on habits and self-development. He's James Clear, and here's my take on his top 10 rules to success. Let's kick it off with rule number one, build good habits. One of the phrases I use and I have this in the book is that habits are the compound interest of self-improvement. So it's like the same way that compound interest you know, accrues through finance, your, the effects of your habits multiply over time. And so often these choices that you make, they're these little 1% improvements for you or against you each day, and they're very easy to overlook on a daily basis, right? Like, what, what really is the difference between eating a burger and fries or a salad and chicken for lunch? Mm. You don't really see a whole lot. lot better. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> it tastes that's amazing actually, in the moment. That's actually a crucial point uh, that I cover in the book, which is that habits that are immediately satisfying are more likely to be repeated. And so pretty much any behavior produces multiple outcomes across time, right? Like if you eat a donut right now, it's tasty mm, and sugary. So good. But in the long run, you gain weight. And so the... The immediate outcome is favorable. The long-term outcome is unfavorable. With good habits, it's often the reverse, right? Like you go to the gym right now, and it takes effort, you sweat, you have to work hard. You have to sacrifice outcome, your time for Netflix and chill to go train. The immediate outcome is unfavorable, but the ultimate outcome, you're in shape and in a, you know, a year, a month, or whatever, right. is favorable. And so the challenge for building good habits and breaking bad ones is often finding a way to pull the long-term consequences of your bad habits into the immediate moment so you feel a little bit of the pain right now and want to avoid it, and the long-term rewards of your good habits into the immediate moment so that you have a reason to repeat it again in the future. Each behavior casts a vote for the type of person that you want to become. And if you cast enough votes for that type of identity, you start to believe that about yourself, right? Like if you... You go to church for 20 years, you believe that you're religious. You study Spanish every Tuesday for 30 minutes, you believe mm -hmm. that you are studious. Um, so in that way, your habits provide evidence of your desired identity. And I think that that is probably the ultimate reason that habits are so important. It's true, like habits can help you earn more money or be more productive or lose weight. Um, and all that stuff is great. But in addition to the external results that habits provide, they also shape your sense of self. They like are the, the engine or the avenue through which you learn to believe things about yourself. Like sometimes people will say stuff like, fake it till you make it. But fake it till you make it is asking yourself to believe something without evidence for it. And you can do that for a little while. You could do it for a day or a week. But eventually, I mean, there's a word for beliefs that don't have evidence behind them. It's delusion, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're deluding yourself, then eventually you give up on that. But the power of doing a better habit each day or casting a little vote for that type of person is that now you have evidence to root your belief in. Yeah, and so now I've done it for six up, months, yeah. Right? Like, I mean, now you have a lot of evidence that you're a podcaster or a right. good interviewer. You know, like you do this over and over again. Each time you cast a vote for believing that about yourself. And you don't just, you aren't delusionally believing that you're a good interviewer. It's because you've shown up and done it hundreds of times. Right. Um, and so I think that that's true for any habit, large or small that they provide evidence of the desired identity or the, the type of person that you are. Rule number two, put in the reps. There's this professor at the University of Florida. He's retired now. He was a photography professor. His name's Jerry Ullsman. And uh, at the beginning of the semester, he would have this film photography class and he'd bring the class in and he would split them into two groups. And he said, everybody on this side of the room, you're going to be graded on the quantity of work that you do this uh, semester. And everybody on this side of the room, you're going to be graded on the quality of work that you do this semester. And he further explained it by saying that for your film photography, you're going to be responsible for having 100 pictures. If you do 100 photos over the course of the semester, that'll be an A. If you do 90, it'll be a B. If you do 80, it'll be a C, and so on. So it's quantity. For this group, you only have to produce one photo but it has to be the most perfect photo that you can make, the best photo that you can make. An interesting, an interesting thing happened. At the end of the term, all the best grades came from the quantity group, not from the quality group. 
And what ended up happening was that while people were busy experimenting, making mistakes, learning how to you know, play with composition and so on, they would come across a really great photo. And while the quality group was busy theorizing about what perfection would look like and how to take the perfect photo and not actually honing their skills, they ended up only making something mediocre or average. And the important insight here, especially for habits, is that in the beginning, the most important thing is just to shut up and put your reps in. Just make sure that you hone the skill, right? And you can start to think of it, the way that I like to think of it is that any outcome that you wish to achieve is just a point along the spectrum of repetitions. So if you have few reps to more reps, and you can imagine an easy goal, a moderate goal, a hard goal, the more reps that you put in, the more, that you, more likely you, you are to achieve that goal. So maybe point A is, you know, let's take fitness, squatting 100 pounds, point B is squatting 200, point C is squatting 300. Maybe you need to put in 100 reps or 1,000 reps to get to point A, maybe it's 5,000 to get to point B, maybe it's 10,000 to get to point C. Rule number three, challenge yourself. So occasionally, and this is true for everybody, if you live long enough, life will come for you at some point, right? Like something's going to happen. Um, so occasionally life will stress you. But when life doesn't challenge you, I think it's important to challenge yourself because otherwise you're just living in this optimal environment, air conditioning, and you know everything else is super easy. You can get all the information in the world at your fingertips. You never have to like, if you think about how crazy just eating is in the modern world. So previously, when we lived in tribes, you, it, you had to expend energy to get calories. Um, at a minimum, you were foraging for berries, but otherwise you probably had to like run something down and kill it or part of a group hunt or all kinds of other things. Now you can get calories without expending any. All you have to do is just tap like Uber Eats on your phone or something. It'll show up at your door um, and you can just sit on the couch, which is, of course, like a recipe for uh, poor health. But also just it's the game has completely changed now. We've transcended a lot of our evolutionary programming and natural um, situations. And so you need to be careful about designing that to serve you rather than to work against you because it can very easily nudge you in the other direction. Rule number four, exercise and read. I think there are a few core habits that are gonna serve everybody and certainly serve me well. So exercise is a huge one. Um, I don't do it daily, but I exercise, I train four times a week. Yeah. And I feel like if I didn't exercise, I don't know that I would be an entrepreneur. Like, I don't know if I could handle the psychological roller coaster without the physical outlet. Yeah, the release, the... You probably feel that as yeah. like an athlete too, you know, like gotcha. I, for uh, being an athlete for so many years, I feel like I need to push myself physically in addition to mentally. Absolutely. If it's just mental, <clears throat> it doesn't do it for me. I, I no. need to have a physical outlet. So exercise. Exercise is one. The other, the ultimate meta habit is reading. Because if you build a habit of reading, you can solve pretty much any other problem. You know, you hmm. want to learn how to be a better podcaster, you can read about that. You want right. to learn how to meditate, you can read about that. You want to learn how to make more money, you can read about that. Um, and so what you need is to develop a habit of reading and then whatever problem you're facing at the time, you can, you have a method for solving that. Rule number five, have a plan. One of my favorite studies is about exercise and they had three cohorts in this study. So they have first cohort, they said, I just want you to track how often you work out over the next few weeks, right? So that's the, the, um, standard cohort, the control group. Second group is that we want you to track how often you exercise. We're also going to give you a motivation, motivational speech, presentation, talk about the benefits of heart health, why habits are good for you, and so on. So this is the motivated group, right? The third group, they got the same presentation, so they're equally motivated, and then they did one thing differently. And that one thing was they filled out this sentence. They said, during the next week, I will partake in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise on this day, in this at this time, in this place, right? They specifically stated their intention to implement the behavior, so implementation intention. Here's what happened. First group, one out of three of them worked out. Second group, motivation did nothing. As soon as they left the researcher's facility the next day, they weren't motivated. It's like reading a book or watching a YouTube or listening to a motivational speaker and then you forget all about it 20 minutes later. Um, but the third group, the group that had a specific plan for how they were gonna implement the behavior, nine out of 10 of them worked out. So you can increase your odds of success two to three X just by having a specific plan. And this is the insight. Many people think that they lack motivation when what they really lack is clarity. They think that they need to get more motivated, that they need willpower in order to execute on a habit. If I just felt like writing, if I just felt like meditating, if I felt like working out, then I would do it. But in fact, they don't have a plan for it, and so they wake up each day thinking, I wonder if I'll feel motivated to write today. I wonder if I'll feel motivated to work out today. But instead, you can take the decision-making out of it by explicitly stating when, where, and how you want to implement the habit. 
it sounds easy to say, let's just start a plan, let's you know, write down exactly what you should do and then maybe you'll follow through on it. But of course, we all know that there are challenges that arise, it's not quite that easy. So here's a little strategy that I like to use to make sure you can come up with a better plan of action and it's called a failure pre-mortem. So the way that it works is you think about the habit, the project, the goal, whatever the most important thing is that you wanna work on. And then I want you to imagine, fast forward six months from now and you failed and then tell the story of why you failed. What happened, what challenges did you encounter, what was it that took you off course? Um, when I do this with businesses, sometimes we call it the kill the company exercise, because everybody just sits around and thinks about ways to kill the company in the next six months. And uh, once you have all that stuff laid out on the table in front of you, you can start to make better choices about how to develop a plan. You can start to have if-then plans, so not only do I want to exercise for 20 minutes on Monday at 5 p.m., but also if I do not exercise because I have to take my kid to practice or whatever, then Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. I will go in, right? You can have ways to adjust for these challenges. Rule number six, get rid of bad habits. I think we actually have like three options for breaking bad habits. So the first option is to reduce exposure. Um, so something like, you know, if you want to stop spending so much money on electronics, then don't follow all the latest tech review blogs, you know, like you're, or if you want to lose weight, don't follow a bunch of food bloggers on Instagram. Um, you're constantly being triggered by that and having to like overcome the prompts. Now that doesn't always work, but if you can cut a habit off at the source, then a lot of the time, like the craving won't arise, uh, naturally. So in atomic habits in the book, I talk a little bit about this woman who she smoked while she was in college and she would always smoke while riding horses with a friend. And so eventually at some point she quit smoking uh, and she's also stopped, you know, like seeing that friend and graduated from college and so on, wasn't riding horses. And then like 10 years later, she got back on a horse for the first time and suddenly craved a cigarette. And um, she was like, what is going on here? And it's your habits are often tied to a context. They're tied to a situation or some kind of cue. And so if you can reduce exposure to that cue, then in many cases, the craving won't arise. So that's the first option for breaking a bad habit. The second option, which kind of sucks, but is like to sit with the craving long enough to like let this wave of desire ride itself out. And so you basically just resist temptation. Um, it's possible, it's easier if, um, if your hand is forced, if you use what I call a commitment device. So brief story real quick, Victor Hugo, um, famous author who wrote like Hunchback of Notre Dame and a bunch of other things. Well, when he got the book deal for Hunchback of Notre Dame, he just procrastinated for like a year. He hosted a bunch of house parties, has friends over, he went traveling for a little while. He was he, yeah, he, he, <laughs> like, he got the book deal, he did nothing, no work. Um, and uh, eventually his publisher got pissed off. They were like, you know, can you please like actually work on this? And so they set this ultimatum for him and they said, uh, we're going to, we're going to cancel the book in six months if you don't have it done by then. And so he, um, he got his assistant to come in, put all his clothes into a chest and they locked him up and took him out of the house. And the only thing he was left with was like this, this shawl, this like large robe. So basically he had no clothes that were suitable for hosting guests or for leaving the house or like going on trips or anything else. So he more or less put himself on house arrest. Um, and, what ended up happening was each time procrastination arose, he was able to kind of sit with that feeling and let it ride because he didn't really have many other options and then get back to work on the book. And it ended up working. He got the book done like two weeks early. But things like that where you can lock in your future action and it, it becomes really hard to go to your friend's party or go out to you know travel to a different place or whatever um, just because you don't have the option. If you can increase the friction, then sometimes you can sit with the craving of a bad habit and let it ride out. So that's your second choice. And then the third choice is the one that you just mentioned, which is you take the solution that the bad habit is providing, the way that it's serving you, and you find a new behavior that get, delivers that same outcome. Rule number seven, develop expertise. What makes you an expert on habits? Oh man. Based uh, on <laughs> lots of other people that are talking about habits. I think that, and I've said this many times before, I'm just going through this with everybody else. Uh, I consider my readers my peers uh, in the sense that we're all just trying things out. The only difference is I write about what I learn and share it each week, mm -hmm. and, but we're all just learning along the way. Um, early on, I had a feeling like that. I was like, who am I to, you know, I'm just a guy. Who am I yeah. to write about this? And I had a friend tell me the way you develop expertise is by writing about it every week. So I wrote a, a new article about habits every Monday and Thursday for three years. And that was how I developed the expertise on the topic was by you, writing yeah. about it. You did research. Right. And you said, here's what I found. Here's what I tried. 
Here's what worked, what didn't work. It's a combination of me reading the scientific literature and reading the research and then trying to distill the practical insights from that and testing things out in my own life as a weightlifter, a travel photographer, a writer, an entrepreneur, and seeing what that looks like and then the two together. And I think you need both. Like I don't wanna be some new age version of an academic who's in an ivory tower just like theorizing about ideas is different what it looks like to put ideas into practice, mm -hmm. right? Like imagine you're a peak performance coach and you show up to coach like an NBA team. And these guys are like, dude, you need to step on the court if you know what, right, to see what it's actually like. Rule number eight, change your environment. You don't have to be the victim of your environment. You can also be the architect of it. You can decide to design something to make your good behaviors easier and your bad behaviors harder. So when it comes to habits, if you wanna practice your guitar more frequently, put it right in the middle of your living room so you run across it all the time. You want to read more when you make your bed in the morning, take the book you want to read, put it on top of the pillow. When you come back that night, pick it up, read a few pages, go to sleep. For me, I, uh, I used to buy apples all the time and then I would put them in the crisper at the bottom of the fridge and they would sit there for three weeks and go bad and I'd finally open it up and see them again and get mad. And then eventually, I bought a bowl and put it right in the middle of the counter. And so then when I buy apples, I put them there, I see them every day and now I eat them all the time. Um, many of our desires are simply shaped because we have an environment that shapes us in that way. So the moral of this story is I've never seen someone stick to positive habits in a consistent fashion in a negative environment. Maybe you can overpower it once or twice, maybe you can have the willpower to do the right thing on one day, but if you're constantly fighting against those forces, it's gonna be very hard to follow through. Rule number nine, change your identity. I think true behavior change is identity change. Um, and it's this shifting of your self-image or your beliefs or the way you look at yourself. Because it's one thing to say that I want this and it's something very different to say I am this. So people walk around with beliefs like that all the time. I'm not a language learner. I'm not good at math. I'm terrible with directions. I'm not good mm -hmm. at remembering someone's name. Yeah. And once you have those type of, uh, once you adopt that identity, it becomes very easy to just reinforce that over and over again. And so uh, these three levels that you mentioned, outcomes, process, and identity, all three matter. But I think the key is that you want the direction of change to be in the right way, the, the right arrow. So if you start with the outcomes, if you start with the result, then you're like, oh, I really want this thing. And here's my plan for getting it. And most people just never think about the identity that comes underneath that. Like they think, I want to lose weight or I want to be skinny. And if I follow this diet, then I'll be skinny. And then they, they don't really give any thought to the, the beliefs behind their behavior. But if you start the other way around, if you start at the identity and you say, all right, who's the type of person that could lose weight? Well, maybe it's the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. Mm. Then you, foster, you start with that identity. You say, okay, I want to become the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. Here are the habits I need to build. And then whatever results come, just come naturally. So most people focus on the results and build a plan and let the identity come naturally, but that rarely works because their beliefs like conflict with your actions. But if you start with the identity and you build the habits to reinforce that, then the results just come on their own. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is be systems oriented. Most people are familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan stopping along the side of the road to help, uh, help a fallen person, help someone in need. Well. Princeton, their theology school decided to run this uh, experiment. And they brought in a bunch of theology students. They said, all right, we're all familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. We're going to break you up into groups, and you're going to go teach in different rooms across campus. You're going to teach this story. And so they started talking about you know, how they were going to deliver the presentation and so on. And they had a couple different cohorts. The one cohort, they said, all right, just go ahead and you know, go off and, uh, and deliver the presentation. So they went off to their rooms. Um, the second one, though, they did something interesting. They sent the group off, but on their way, to the, uh, well, they sent the group off and they said, by the way, we're running a little bit behind, right? You, you don't have very long to get there. It takes about 10 minutes, you only got five, so we kind of need to hurry. Um, you're probably already gonna be late. So they're in a rush, they know they're gonna go give this presentation. On the way, they planted an actor on the, uh, on the campus. And this actor is laying on the ground, hurt, moaning in pain. And so they scream twice and then they cry out. And every single group, went right past the person in need to go give a presentation about helping a person in need. Right? The one person even stepped over the guy who was in pain in order to get there. Now, the point of this, and what I'd like to start talking about now, is the danger of being goal-focused and goal-oriented. These people had a goal, right, to deliver a presentation. And they were so one-sided, so narrow-minded, so focused on that goal, that they miss the bigger picture and the perspective of what they should have been doing in the first place. And I think that this can be a danger of goals often. And so instead, I would like to encourage us to focus on systems, systems rather than goals. Here are some examples. If you're a coach, your goal is to win a championship, but your system is what your team does at practice each day. 
If you're a writer, your goal might be to write a book, maybe even write a best-selling book, but your system is how you write each week, the schedule that you follow. If you're an entrepreneur, your goal could be to build a million dollar business or a $10 million business, but the system is the sales and marketing process that you have. The systems are what actually make the difference. They're what drive the results. And what I've seen, having goals is great. Having a vision, having a dream is nice. It's important to know where you're going and where you're headed. It's important to have some clarity of focus, to know that we're moving in this direction. But once you know that, having the goal on paper makes very little difference. And committing to the system and showing up every day drives a lot of results. Now I've got a really special bonus clip from James on how to change the way that you think that I think you're gonna really enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three point landing questions. Time to move from just watching another video to actually taking action in your life or your business. And if you're feeling bold, leave your answers in the comments below. Here we go. Question number one, what will you change in your environment to better serve you? Number two, what will you change to your identity to better serve you? And number three, what bad habit will you eliminate today? Let's bust the myth of how many days it takes to set a habit. <laughs> because there's 14 days, 28 days, 60 days, yeah. a year. Right. If you do something every single day, and maybe it changes for each person, but what's the science or the, uh, the statistics say about how long it takes to form a positive or negative habit, I guess? So 21 days is the thing you hear all the time, 30 days, 100 days, whatever. Right now, 66 days is making the rounds is the latest I saw time. that in another book. What was that book? Well, there was one study done that found that 66 days was the average uh, for how long it takes. And as a rule of thumb, I don't think it's terrible. Like, you should remind mm -hmm. yourself, yeah, this is going to be months of work. It's not just going to yeah. be something quick. But even within that study, the range was quite wide. So if you did something simple, like drink a glass of water at lunch each day, it would take like three weeks. If you yeah. did something more difficult, like go for a run after work every day, that would be like seven or eight months. But I think actually that question to begin with is sort of a, there's like a broken mentality the behind it. The wrong question. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Because if you ask that question, the implicit assumption is, when do I have to stop working? Or when, when is this done? Um, and, and is it automatic after a certain period of time? Well, the honest answer to how long it takes to build a new habit is forever. Because if you stop, then it's no longer a habit. It's a constant choice and a decision, right? I think people often look at habits as like a finish line to be crossed, but it's actually a lifestyle to be lived. Mm. And if you look at it as a lifestyle change, then you're saying, you know, okay, okay, what's something small and sustainable I can stick to, right? What's something that can actually last over time? Raise your standard. Apple at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. Not one drop of my self-worth depends on your acceptance of me. If you like this video, check out the top 10 I did on Tim Ferriss. The link is right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. You have to, I believe, let small bad things happen constantly to have any agenda of your own.